Now I want to take you, first of all, to, to a very loud, very smelly, very disgusting place, the most disgusting place in the world. I'm not talking about cabin seven on a Friday night of week one. Uh, I'm talking about the belly of the great fish and Jonah stuck in the middle of that horrible stench and mess. And he had a prayer that uh, we perhaps know about, but maybe not focus on it too much. And he says something in that prayer that is relevant to our subject and is actually really quite precious and really profound. Uh, Coming out of the mouth of possibly the worst servant God has ever had in terms of uh, how he served him in, in, in different ways and his attitude. And this is what Jonah said to his God in the middle of the fish. He says, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. And what I wanted to do today, for the most part, is is unpack that verse phrase by phrase. Uh, Some of our younger people have been doing a bit of a study um, called Pronounce It. And you take a little verse and you pronounce each section of it and see what that has to say to you. I'm going to follow that technique today and see how that goes. Now, one of the um, keys to Bible study is to be aware of the different translations of the Bible that we use. And some verses are translated uh, quite similarly across different translations, but others are very different. And this is a verse where the translations given are quite different and quite diverse. And uh, we'll probably pick up on this a little later. But um, you can read those for yourself. But particularly, I wanted to draw attention to the ISV, which is the International Standard Version. And it says, those who cling to vain idols leave behind the gracious love that could have been theirs. And I think that's quite um, a poignant way of, of saying the same thing. But there are different, uh, different words used in different translations of the Bible. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, said Jonah. Who was he talking about? Who was he talking about when he said those? Was it the idol worship of the Ninevites that he'd been sent to? Now, the Ninevites were from the city of Nineveh, which is uh, round about modern-day Iraq, and at that time was part of the Assyrian Empire, which is a long, long gone, and they were an enemy of, of Israel, a mortal enemy, and were a wicked people and did lots of terrible things to people that they conquered. You might not know that they were famous for innovating and inventions and things like the lock and key on your door, the pavement outside your door, um, the clock in your house, uh, the mailboxes outside my house, the library down the street, all these things, even to the point of determining there were 360 degrees in a circle, that was all the Assyrians. That was all the people of Nineveh who uh, were quite modern for their time. There's some pictures of um, artists' impressions of what their gods, or some of them at least, might have looked like. And the one uh, with looking like the fish stuck on his head is the fish god, unsurprisingly. Strange, strange characters. And here is a, a little chart of how all their different gods, or at least the top-ranking ones, all fixed together. And some uh, had different attributes. Many were related to war. And uh, there was also more judgment, mercy, victory. There wasn't one god that kind of fit the bill for everything. So they had to invent a lot of them. And they all had their special uh, role and special powers uh, that they could draw upon. So when we look at Nineveh, we can look at maybe the gods of an advanced civilization. Um, doing quite okay, thank you very much, were very self-sufficient. But there were times when they needed gods to help them get through life, and they called upon their gods in time of need, particularly in time of war, to help them win. Is is that who uh, Jonah was talking about? Perhaps, and I think it's probably unlikely because uh, we don't tend to look inward, we tend to look outward, perhaps um, Jonah was looking a bit closer to home, and he was pointing the finger at his own people and the idol worship of the Israelites, because we know from the Old Testament that um, they had a big problem with idol worship. 
And it seems baffling to us today, perhaps, but that's certainly the case. And God warned them very early on in the book of Deuteronomy. He says, be careful not to be ensnared by their ways, the ways of the other nations. Don't inquire about their gods, asking, how do these nations serve their gods? I will do likewise. You mustn't worship the Lord your God in their way. And he explains um, some of the horrific things that these foreign nations got involved with when they got involved in idol worship. And uh, it's quite disgusting and quite horrific to, to our minds. And yet, for some reason, Israel was sucked into this. And we read in 2 Kings chapter 7, the sad story that they rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their ancestors and the statutes he had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them. Although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. And so they'd been warned and they didn't take the advice and they got sucked in. Sucked into the thinking and the behavior of those around them. So was, was Jonah thinking of his own people? Was he thinking of himself? I think that's even more unlikely. Um, that's the last person we tend to look at when we're evaluating things. But when we look at Jonah, he had a lot of wrong thinking, didn't he? He had a lot of wrong thinking about who God was and, and the God's sovereignty and his right to dictate to God what God wanted to do. He had the wrong idea about the Ninevites to say that they weren't worthy of God's mercy and they should be judged. And he had, had the wrong idea about himself and he, he thought he could get away with escaping from God. And uh, that, that wrong thinking led to a lot of wrong behavior on the part of Jonah. And at the root of it, we might not think about it in that way, but in the root of it, Jonah had his own idols as well that had to be dealt with by God. As we said, wrong thinking about God, about others and about himself. And perhaps it's a good time to ask the question, was Jonah speaking to me? Was Jonah speaking to you all those centuries later? You know, we live in what we consider to be an advanced civilization, don't we? New inventions every day. And uh, a lot of people have decided there's no need for God. Science is the answer. Um, perhaps people have all kinds of crutches to get them through, through life. Perhaps we have borrowed some of those in our own day-to-day -day experience. Perhaps we've got sucked in to uh, the world's way of thinking and how the world responds to things, how the world thinks. And it's kind of crept in and we haven't really noticed. Maybe, maybe that's true. Because I think one of the things about the topic of idolatry is that it's a level playing field, isn't it? If we're honest with ourselves, each one of us has something or somebody in our lives that is taking a place that it shouldn't have. It's taking the place of God and uh, what he wants for our lives. And if we're in denial of that, then we can be certain we've set ourselves up as our own idol. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, says Jonah. So what are vain idols? What does that word mean when we dig into it a little bit more? Vain means worthless, false, empty, useless, serves no good purpose. If you think of uh, the old-fashioned way of saying, don't take the Lord's name in vain, you might have heard that. Don't, um, don't say, oh my God, or even OMG. Because it's, it's in vain. There's no purpose in doing that. It's an offhand. You're not asking for God's help or his mercy or anything. It's just an off-the-cuff statement. It serves no good purpose, and so it's vain. And that's the thought of these, uh, these idols. There's no worth to them, and, and they're empty. And then the word idols, if you dig into the, the original language, it's, a, it's connected with the thought of things that are like a breath. They're like a vapor. They're insubstantial and they don't last. Contrary to what they might appear at the time, they can, they can appear to be the biggest thing in people's lives and the, the focus of their lives. And then perhaps suddenly, or perhaps over time, we realize that really they're just, they're just 
like, like the breath, like vapor, and they're gone. And we're left without, without the help and the support that we thought they were providing. Now, somebody was asking me, why did I bring this? It's a bit like an idol, doesn't it? It's like a, an Assyrian idol. Um, back, back to my son's childhood for a little bit. Um, anyone know what these are? Go-Go's. Go-Go's. Um, these, uh, they look a little bit like Assyrian gods, but they're not. They're little plastic toys that you can collect, and there were hundreds of them. And um, each one came in different colors, and you could buy them at the store in vast quantities and at vast prices. And um, lots of people were hooked on these and collecting them, and they had sticker albums and all the rest of it. And um, we spent a lot of time uh, a few years ago in, in the pursuit of collecting the set. And uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, it's kind of, a, kind of a family activity. Um, I went down to hunt in the basement today and uh, find these. There we are. Un untouched. Untouched for years, you know. Probably a few hundred dollars there. Uh, now worth about 20 cents. I'm waiting for somebody on eBay to make me an offer. Um, I'm hoping one day in 50 years time there'll be vintage antiques. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. Here we go. Uh, these are Pokemon cards. Went down. This wasn't in the basement actually, this was in a cupboard. There we go. Lots of EXs, lots of uh, mega whatever they're called now. Now, they're still worth a bit, actually, but uh, again, there we go. We're not finished yet. Mighty Beans, this is just one of this, uh, is this a full set? Yeah, there we go. A full set of Mexican jumping beans, all with silly designs and, and wonderful names and different types of rarities, bomb disposal bean, commando bean, Frankenstein bean, Jekyll and Hyde bean. Praying Mantis Bean. I'm not going to throw these out because I'll. There we go. There we go. Um, now, obviously, we had a lot of fun with those at the time, and um, as you as you get older, hopefully, these types of things kind of um, don't become as important to you, and you forget about them, move on to more adult things. <coughs> Fortnite. <coughs> um, but um, the um, it's a serious point that even as adults we can find ourselves getting sucked in to things that take a lot of our time, a lot of our attention, a lot of our passion. And maybe in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time, we'll look back and really, really think, what were we thinking? And was that a good use of my time? Um, older ones amongst us will look back at things that, like that. And younger ones, I'd encourage you to just, just pause for thought every so often and think about how you're spending your time and the value that's in it. Because God says, when you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. The wind will carry them all off. A breath will take them away. But he who takes refuge in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. And there's this great contrast with these idols that are like the breath. God is offering us a stake of inheritance in his land and at his holy mountain. And that is, these are things that are eternal and are of lasting value. What about idols in the New Testament and, and today? You know, one, of the, one of the curious things about the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament is that idol worship that was so prevalent in the Old Testament in, in Israel, and time and time again they went back to the idols and set up high places and worshipped these false gods and did lots of terrible things. Because of the non-Israelites that they mix with, that all seems to disappear when it gets to the New Testament. And yet, the Jewish people that would have formed, by and large, a lot of the church in Jerusalem, as it spread out, and Gentiles and Greeks came in with all their history of false gods, you don't read a hint of the infiltration of false gods into the early church. Um, it's quite remarkable. And the only thing I can think of is the power of the Holy Spirit. 
to prevent that, prevent that from happening. Um, and I think today, we, we very rarely see Christians, born-again Christians, being sucked into, into idol worship. Certainly, it's not publicized very much. Um, so that's not the issue for us today. When we talk about idolatry, we're not worried about bowing down to a Buddha or one of the Hindu gods or what, whatever it might be. That doesn't seem to have a hold on us. That is not certain strategy for us today. But that doesn't mean that idolatry isn't a big issue for us today, because it is. Colossians 3 and 5 says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Now, the students of the Greek will be able to tell me, does that word idolatry refer to just greed or the whole list? doesn't necessarily matter, but let's focus on greed as that um, pursuit of something, money or possessions, that eventually is like a, like a vapor, like a breath. In the grand scheme of eternity, it's gone. And Paul is saying through the Holy Spirit that that's idolatry. We're, we're, we're almost ascribing divine attributes to earthly things. Um, you know, talks about in Romans about people who exchange the truth of God for a lie. And that's not the great exchange, that's the dumb exchange that many people get sucked into. And um, greed is one of those big things that we have to guard against. No matter who we are or where we are in the world, it's a big issue. Seems to me that there are two categories of things that we have to watch out for today. And it's things that creep in and it's things that can get crowded out. And they're kind of different things but they complement each other. Things that creep in and things that creep out. This is a real website article about a church in Galway offering a drive through Ash Wednesday service so that you can get a mark on your forehead and as you drive through on the way to, to the shopping. I, I thought they should have called it Dash Wednesday, not Ash Wednesday, but um, I think uh, Shrove Tuesday would be much more popular, but um, drive through pancakes, but they, haven't, they don't seem to have thought about that. But this, this is real. This is actually happening. Um, and we can laugh at it, and it, sound, it kind of sounds comical. But people have got to the point where their engagement with God, even on this level, we're not going to get into the theology around this, but even, even if this had any value at all, they've crammed their lives with so much that they have to relegate this activity to a drive through and, and it really spoke to me as to whether I can fall into that same trap and sometimes wish we could have drive through prayer meetings and drive through uh, conferences. And sometimes we think, well, you know, I'll, li I'll listen to the ministry in the car, you know, uh, which, which is great. Please don't stop doing that. But if it's stopping you from getting together with other Christians, then I think, I think there might be a problem. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. What does it mean to pay regard? That's a bit of an odd phrasing. Um, you'll see why I chose the ESV a bit later on, but um, it's not my favorite version because some of the words are a little bit tricky, like this. Pay regard. Again, if you dig down, the, the roots of this is a watchman preserving, protecting, guarding, clinging to something they value and they don't want to let go. Um, I've kind of embellished that a little bit, but that's basically what the root, the root of the word is talking about in some uses in the, in the Old Testament clinging to something that they value. And you remember that clinging was one of the words used in one of the translations of uh, this verse. This is a guy called Michael Landy. And behind him is a list of 7,200 and change of all his earthly possessions. And what he's wearing is a blue jumpsuit and in the 1990s, as a part art project and a part um, demonstration against materialism, he decided to systematically destroy and dismantle every one of those 7,000 odd pieces that he owned. And uh, it took him quite a while. And so all he was left with was that blue jumpsuit. This really happened. It was quite a military operation, and he had a team of people, and it was done in a museum or some kind of art studio, and uh, everything was 
systematically destroyed and dismantled um, everything. Personal letters, certificates, um, CD collection. Some of it was pretty hard to destroy, but he managed to find ways of doing it. And um, he, uh, five minutes after the experiment, someone gave him a Paul Weller CD, and he, he was back down to start again, <laughs> accumulating a collection of stuff. Um, but the, the point is for us, is if that was us, what would we find the most difficult thing in our list of possessions to, to get rid of? And, and it may be that if we put that list in some sort of order, it might tell us where our priorities are. And they're not necessarily bad, but they could be getting in the way of the Lord's things and the Lord's work. Of course, our family and the things that are precious to our family, uh, of course, have a real value. But there are other things that are just possessions at the end of the day that we accumulate. And um, those are the things that we might, we might decide uh, are excess. Project breakdown, this was called. Um, I think if we tried to do this, we might have a breakdown. It's not as easy as it looks. And this guy actually went ahead and did it. And uh, you can read it on the BBC how he went on. Here we come to the crux of it. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. What and whose is this steadfast love? And again, if you read the different versions, you might get a different thought from it. But the ESV uh, is referring to God, God and his steadfast love. Because steadfast love is actually one of the defining and the self-defining characteristics of God, of our God. And um, if you don't read the ESV version, you're quite likely to miss this point entirely. And it's a really significant one. When I say self-defining, this is what I mean. He says in Exodus 34 that the Lord, the Lord, a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Steadfast love is one of the foundations of God's covenant love and God's covenant with his people. And you'll see this verse, this word cropping up time and time again, I think about 200 times in the Old Testament. And uh, the person that used it the most, it won't be a surprise to you, it's King David and in the Psalms. And there's one particular Psalm where he, every other line, this word comes up, although it's translated in many Bibles as loving kindness. It's the same word that we find um, in many other places with different uh, translations. And it was said of uh, God in 1 Kings 8, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants. And so that's the steadfast love that Jonah, all the way back in this stinking hole of a, of a fish, he's able to lift his thoughts and think back to his God and his steadfast love. God is saying to us, I'll be there for you. He's saying to Israel, I'll be there for you. My love is steadfast. You can rely on it no matter what happens. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. So yeah, another slightly antiquated phrase, an old-fashioned phrase. What does it mean to forsake their hope? It can mean to leave behind, to abandon, to become widowed. That really brings it home, doesn't it? To become widowed. It's like saying to God, you're dead to me. I've gone. I've left you behind. You're dead to me going forward. That is... <coughs> That is what Jonah was worried about, that people who put other things first are leaving God for dead. And that's a very, very serious thing. So it begs the question, here today, can we ever fall outside of God's steadfast love? Is it possible for Christians today, for you, for me, to fall outside of God's steadfast love? Going back to that verse in 1 Kings, there was a bit we didn't read, it's a bit in red. It's almost like a condition to experience this steadfast love on the part of God's servants. It says, it's for those servants who walk before you with all their heart. 
putting God first is the way to experience his steadfast love. And he says in Jeremiah 16, I've taken away my peace from this people, my steadfast love and mercy, declares the Lord. Back to the verse that Brian opened with, in part, Jude. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That implies it's possible for us not to be kept in the love of God. Otherwise, why say, why command us to keep ourselves in the love of God? Now, I suggest to you that, that we're not at risk of losing our salvation. Let's not make that mistake. When we talk about God's covenant love and how it applies in the New Testament, that is secure. That is never going to change. That is eternal. It's guaranteed. No matter what we do, no matter whether we leave God for dead, his salvation is powerful enough to protect us through that. Um, I have friends, you probably have friends too, who would now consider themselves to be atheists and don't believe in God. They're still saved. That profession of salvation is still valid in God's sight, and we thank God for that. So that's not, not, what, not what is at risk here. But I suggest to you that there is something that is at risk. Let's look at the experience briefly of the prodigal son. We all know the story. Um, the guy that uh, ended up uh, eating the food with the pigs and realizing he'd made a terrible mistake. He left his father for dead, effectively. Walked out the door, gone his own way, and the penny had dropped that he'd done a very bad thing, and he's prepared to go home. But the sad thing is that he either didn't know his father very well, or he'd forgotten what his father was like. And he thought that if he went back, apologetic and remorseful and sorry, that his father might be willing to accept him back as a servant. So, young man, you don't know your father, you've forgotten. His father was out, outside his door waiting for him, waiting for the day when he, when he was going to come back. And he welcomes him back. And he says, kill the fatted calf. Let's have a party. Let's celebrate. My son is back. That is steadfast love. That is the steadfast love of God. The, the prodigal son had, had walked away and left it behind, but it was still there. He had to go back and, and put his father and his father's things first and say, I'm going to come back and work for you. I'm not going to work for myself anymore. I'm not going to look after myself. And that is such a beautiful picture of God's steadfast love. We can be outside of it. And if, we don't, if we're not feeling God's love, it's not because he's gone away. It's because we might have moved and gone away, and we need to turn back and to put God first. So how do we do it? How do we keep ourselves in God's love? Lots of ways. We don't have time to go into this in any depth. But part of the answer is, and I finally got to the topic that I was supposed to speak on, by tearing down and by tearing out. So we go from Jonah to Josiah. And we often think of David as the greatest king. Josiah must have been a hair's breadth behind him in the voting. What a, what a king he was, coming to the throne at the age of eight. And uh, it says he had a lot of... Um, Talk about Project Breakdown. This was Project Breakdown. He inherited a really bad situation in Israel. Idolatry was rife, and he had to get to grips with it. And it says, please go home and read the whole of this chapter, chapter 23. But it says, the altars he pulled down and broke in pieces and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. And the king defiled the high places for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Milcom, or Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites. And he broke in pieces the pillars and cut down the Asherim and filled their places with the bones of men. That's very appropriate for Halloween, isn't it? Filling these high places with the bones of men. Pulling down the altars to the false gods, breaking them in pieces and casting the dust of them into the brook. And then filling the places with bones of men making them unclean, making them the last place you would want to go. And if something's broken down into dust and cast onto the waters and by now it's in the sea, those things aren't coming back. It's a zero-tolerance policy. 
He didn't just put a sign up saying, these are now closed. They were absolutely obliterated and made so that nobody could possibly put them back into service again. I think there's a lesson there for us, isn't there? And then Jesus said, if your eye calls you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. He didn't say, put on a very dark pair of sunglasses or uh, tape it over with some bandage. He says, tear it out and throw it away because it's better that way than you keep on sinning. I don't think that's meant to be literal, by the way, but hopefully we get the point. But before we get too far down the track, we need a bit of caution. We need a bit of balance, don't we? Because as we saw with Jonah, wrong thinking led to wrong behavior. And it's true that right thinking leads to right behavior. And if we were simply to focus on the tearing down and the tearing out in terms of our behavior, it's probably not going to be as successful as we hoped it would be. And we know this from our own experience. If we're trying to lose weight, we don't focus so much on the fish and chips that we didn't have or the two pieces of crackers that we had instead. We focus on our goal and how we'll feel when that, that goal is achieved. When we're saving up for a house or a car or a holiday or whatever, we don't focus so much on the fact that we watch Netflix instead of going to the movies and save 20 bucks that went into the pot. We focus on the goal, what we're, what we're aiming at, that nice vacation, whatever it might be. And it's the same with us, isn't it, in our, in our Christian experience. We need to have our thinking right, and then our behavior will be much more easy for us to accomplish. I wanted to finish on that note with a poem or a hymn. And with this, I'll close. Hast thou heard him, seen him, known him? Is not thine a captured heart? Chief among 10,000 own him, joyful, choose the better part. Captivated by his beauty, worthy tribute haste to bring. Let his peerless worth constrain thee, crown him now, unrivaled king. Idols, once they won thee, charm thee, lovely things of time and sense. Gilded thus, does sin disarm thee, honeyed, lest thou turn thee thence. Something is gilded, it's, there's like a veneer, like a little covering of something to make it look attractive. Uh, you might put a, a, a gilding of, of, of silver on something, and you think the whole thing is silver, but actually it's, it's not, it's just tin underneath. That's what a gilding means, and sin can confuse us into thinking it's something that it's not. And it feels like it's sweet like honey, but it's not, it's bitter. What has stripped the seeming beauty from the idols of the earth? Not a sense of right or duty, but the sight of peerless worth. Not the crushing of those idols with its bitter void and smart, but the beaming of his beauty, the unveiling of his heart. Tis the look that melted Peter, tis that face that Stephen saw, Tis that heart that wet with Mary can alone from idols draw. Draw and win and fill completely till the cup or flow the brim. What have we to do with idols who have companied with him?